thee, I am blessed. By life and salvation, my joy and my rest. Thy name be my theme, and thy love be my song. Thy grace shall inspire both my heart and my tongue. O oh, who's like my Savior, he Salem's bright King. He smiles and he loves me and helps me to sing. I'll praise him, I'll praise him with notes loud and clear. While rivers of pleasure my spirit shall cheer. All right, our last hymn this evening is going to be number 337. I know whom I have believed, number 337. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how this saving faith to me he did impart, nor how believing in his word brought peace within my heart. But I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the Word, creating faith in him. But I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not when my Lord may come at night or noonday fair, nor if I'll walk the veil with him or meet him in the air. But I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Amen. Before I preach, our young people are going to come sing evidence. And on their way, I wanted to announce for our Wednesday night um, program this Wednesday night, we will run vans, have 6.30 start, like um, always. Um, but at 7 o'clock in the sanctuary, we're going to have a missionary friend of ours, Jim Bloomstrand. Jim Bloomstrand uh, was a friend of ours. We met in our prison ministry, and then he ministered. After he got out, he ministered in our prison ministry with our church. And he has been a Mexico missionary for over 20 years, I believe now. And uh, he's going to be here and so Wednesday night, I'm letting our, our leaders for the older two groups know that we will probably bring, uh, Sparkies and Cubbies will be the same as always. They'll be in their classes. But I believe our older groups, Dad would like us to have a group in here to hear Brother Jim's ministry. So we will be taking a break um, for missionaries. Um, 
uh, for that missionary service on Wednesday night. So I wanted to mention that. Our kids will now sing Evidence. And at the end of Evidence, uh, we had some girls. Was it y'all girls? Want to sing Jesus Be Jesus in Me? We will close uh, our special with Jesus Be Jesus in Me. So if you would like to sing along with us, and I would encourage you to continue to pray for Brother Richard Stone. As you know, Jesus Be Jesus in Me was... Um, Miss Rejoice's favorite song that she taught our kids. And so uh, just join us as we sing that. And I guess you can sing with us on evidence as well. Jesus. 
Jesus, be Jesus in me. No longer me, but Thee. Resurrection power, fill me this hour. Jesus. Amen. I remember the girls coming home and singing a little song that Miss Rejoice taught them, Jesus be Jesus in me, and I thought, you know what, that's good enough, we all ought to learn that one, amen? And uh, I hope that that is our prayer, amen? Let him live through us. It's good to be in the Lord's house tonight. If you've got your Bibles, take them out and turn to 1 Kings 20. One of my goals when we started this, as Dad said, loosely constructed series, is to familiarize our church with some Old Testament stories that may not be so familiar. Now, as we've gotten into that, we've covered in depth some very familiar stories and individuals. But there are some Bible stories that... Unless you're intentionally reading through the Word of God, which is something you ought to do, you may not be familiar with. And so tonight, we are going to look at 1 Kings 20. Now, that's where we were uh, last week, and we kind of closed out last week's message right around verse 10. Last week's message was called, Take My Wife, Please. Do you all remember that? It was about Jezebel. I'm kind of kidding there, but it was the story of Ahab and his interaction with Ben-Hadad. We talked about Ahab's partial surrender. He gave a very good profession of surrender and faith in Ben-Hadad. He said, I and all that I have is thine. Ben-Hadad said, I want your wife, I want your kids, I want your silver and your gold. Ahab says, you can have it. You can take it. He said, all right, well, even though I'm taking that, I'm going to send my servants in there and they're going to walk around. Anything they think you like of your stuff, they're also going to take that. Ahab said, wait just one minute. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. And so we covered that last week. That was 1 Kings 20, really about verses 1 through 12. But now our text tonight, we're going to look at chapter 20 started with that scenario of Ben-Hadad sieging and sending a message to Ahab that Ahab wound up rejecting, even though it should be noted, he did send back and say, hey, now what you wanted at first, I'll still do that. But I'm not going to let you come in and rummage through my stuff. Now, with that response, Ben-Hadad decides that war will be waged. So look with me, 1 Kings 20. And uh, stand, if you will. I'm going to read about 18 verses for our text, and then we'll really cover this part of the story. And don't be thrown off by tonight's title, but the message title tonight is Ahab's Recipe for Success. Did you all know that Ahab actually did have two major military successes against Syria, against Ben-Hadad? And we will see the groundwork for that. And uh, by the way, no reflection on Ahab's personal character, but God gave Ahab success. Isn't that interesting? And we're going to look at that story tonight. So 1 Kings 20, verse 10, the Bible says, And Ben-Hadad sent unto him Ahab, 
and said, The gods do so unto me, and more also, if the dust of Samaria shall suffice for handfuls for all the people that follow me. Ben had a, hey dad saying, I'm going to come in and wipe you out, Ahab, since you're turning me down on the stuff request. And the king of Israel, Ahab, answered and said, Tell him, let not him that girdeth on his harness boast himself as he that putteth it off. And it came to pass when Ben-Hadad heard this message as he was drinking, he and the kings in the pavilions, that he said unto his servants, Set yourselves in array. And they set themselves in array against the city. And behold, there came a prophet unto Ahab, king of Israel, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will deliver it into thine hand this day, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. And Ahab said, By whom? And he said, Thus saith the Lord, Even by the young men of the princes of the provinces. Then he said, Who shall order the battle? And he answered, Thou. Then he numbered the young men of the princes of the provinces, and they were two hundred and thirty-two. And after them he numbered all the people, even all the children of Israel, being seven thousand. And they went out at noon, but Ben-Hadad was drinking himself drunk in the pavilions, he and the kings, the thirty and two kings that helped him. And the young men of the princes and of the provinces went out first, and Ben-Hadad sent out, and they told him, saying, There are men come out of Samaria. And he said, Whether they be come out for peace, take them alive, or whether they be come out for war, take them alive. So these young men of the princes of the province came out of the city and the army which followed them. And they slew every, man, every one his man and the Syrians fled. And Israel pursued them. And Ben-Hadad the king of Syria escaped on a horse with the horsemen. And the king of Israel went out and smote the horses and chariots and slew the Syrians with a great slaughter. And the people came to the king of Israel and said unto him, And the prophet came to the king of Israel, Ahab, and said unto him, Go strengthen thyself, and mark, and see what thou doest. For at the return of the year the king of Syria will come up against thee. And the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, Their gods are gods of the hills, therefore they were stronger than we. But let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And do this thing, take the kings away, every man out of his place, and put captains in their room. And number thee an army like the army that thou hast lost, horse for horse and chariot for chariot, and we will fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And he hearkened unto their voice, that is, Ben Hadad, and did so. And it came to pass at the return of the year that Ben Hadad numbered the Syrians and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. And the children of Israel were numbered. And were all present and went against them. And the children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids. But the Syrians filled the country. And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver this great multitude into thine hand. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and praise you. God, we thank you for your word. God, I'm thankful that, Lord, you would even show yourself strong to those of us who many times reject you and are not worthy of your mercies and your grace. And God, as we look at this Old Testament story of what you did in the life of the nation of Israel, I pray that we would be able to make application to the lives uh, here represented tonight in our church. I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ that are here, God, that we would be, uh, Lord, edified by your word tonight, that we would, uh, Lord, be better equipped for the work of the ministry, for the, for the spiritual warfare that we must engage in, God. Pray that you'd give us instruction from your word tonight. Lord, I pray you would challenge us, convict us if necessary. And then, Lord, I pray that If there's someone here tonight that's never put their faith and trust in you as Lord and Savior, that tonight would be the night of salvation for them. And then, Lord, we ask that you be exalted, lifted up, and glorified. And we thank you and praise you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. As you know, Ahab was a wicked king. He goes down uh, as the most wicked to date. His dad had had that... 
uh, infamous honor of being the worst up until then. And been, uh, the Bible says of Ahab that Ahab was even worse. He took Jezebel, a princess of the Sidonians, and she introduced Baal worship. And we've looked at some of the drama between uh, Elijah the Tishbite, the prophet that pronounced judgment. And we're not done with that that saga of Elijah versus Ahab and Jezebel, that will still continue after tonight's message. But in some ways, chapter 20 is somewhat of a, a, a variation. It breaks away from the ministry of Elijah. In chapter 19, Elijah had anointed Elisha to fill his shoes. And we're going to go back and see Elijah and then a lot of Elisha's ministry. But in chapter 20, we have this little caveat where we break away from the prophets Elijah and Elisha and we look at a year period, a little over a year period in the life of Israel, of Ahab, the king of Israel, and specifically how he victoriously in two different battles dominated Ben-Hadad and the Syrians. This was not a fight that Ahab provoked. It was a fight that that Ben-Hadad brought to Israel. Ben-Hadad's father had taken land from Israel and no doubt Israel was easy pickings as they had left God in the rearview mirror and God was the strength of Israel's fighting force. That had always been the case and in, in a, um, a lull spiritually in, nation, in the nation's history, they also became conquered in a military sense by the Syrians and other neighbors and so that was a part of God. God's judgment. God uses wicked men and wicked nations many times as His instruments of judgment. And He would do that with His own people. But in this chapter, Ahab gets the victory and he gets the victory twice. He wins two epic battles between he and, and Israel, his men, and the Syrians and Ben-Hadad. And so, tonight, I want to break down a few of the details of these battles. I called it Ahab's recipe for success. We understand that we're not called as God's children to wage war against the Syrians or any other people group. We understand that for most of us, hand-to-hand combat or physical Mortal warfare is not something on our agenda. We do have people that have served in our armed forces and maybe in law enforcement. And there may be times when that takes place. But as a people, as God's people, the New Testament church, we're not called to have any kind of geographical conquest. We're called to take the gospel to all the world and preach the gospel, the Great Commission. And while it's true that the kingdom of God... Jesus said, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. While it's true that I'm not called to take up arms to defend geographical ground, if I make the mistake of thinking that I'm not in a battle, I'm in for a, 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 an awakening. Because the Bible says that when you got saved and when I got saved, we got inserted into a battle. That's right. Do you know that when we got saved, we became children of God? Chet covered that this morning. One of the greatest reasons I believe in the security of the believer is because God adopted me. Amen? And do you know that I'm not going to surprise my heavenly Father? He's not going to disown or kick me out. And by the way, as His child, you may very well run to a far country, but He is waiting, looking down the road for you to come home. And and so, listen, the... the, um, as we, as we look at, at what took place in the Old Testament and the victory that he got, I simply point this out, that you did not get dropped off as a child of God into a playground. You got inserted into a battleground. And if there are things that are true of victory and God working in the lives of His people in the Old Testament, God does not change and there are applications that can be made. This chapter demonstrates the truth that we see in Zechariah 4, 6, when the prophet said, Not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. Do you know that victory comes from the Lord? 
2 Timothy 2, 3, Paul told Timothy to endure hardness as a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 6 says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I'm simply saying that if you're saved, you need to be aware and prepared for spiritual warfare. Amen? Because, you listen... You're either under siege right now or you're, you may be walking on a freshly won victory in your life or you're fixing to go into a battle because if you're alive in this day and age, listen, we, I understand exactly where we're at. We are saved by the grace of God. We are empowered by the Spirit of God and we are hated by the enemy. We're hated by the enemy. And so... Tonight, I want us to look at what took place for Ahab to have these two distinguished victories and see if there's not application for us. Because I will say this, if I'm going to be in a fight, I want to win it. Amen? Amen? Listen, if you know the enemy's coming, and by the way, I don't believe, you're not going to, I've heard people say, we bind Satan, and I understand scripturally where they get that from, but can I just say this? The Bible says that Satan is walking around as a roaring lion. You can't cast Satan into the pit. Did you know that? Now, listen, we serve the one who can, amen? And listen, I've got a good shepherd, and I'm not af- afraid of that mangy old lion, but I need to stay close to my shepherd because the lion, the enemy, the Bible says that the devil, 1 Peter 5, 8, says be sober, be vigilant. We'll come back to this later because the devil is walking around seeking whom he may devour. Amen. Amen. So one thing he guarantees is that I will have conflict. Amen. John 10, 10, he came to give life and life more abundant, but the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So we need to be on guard. If you knew someone was coming to steal, kill, and destroy, I think you'd be prepared, amen? And so if we're going to be in a battle, we want to win it. Now, I simply say that to say that the more I studied this passage, I saw some keys to victory in Ahab's victory that are timeless, And the first one is this, if you want to have success, if you want to win a battle, the first thing that Ahab had going for him was he had the right opponent. (laughs) Amen? Amen. Listen, if you're OU and you schedule Central Arkansas, you're pretty sure you're going to win, amen? (laughs) Amen? Amen? Hey, I, don't give me a hard time if you say, what about the Pokes? Well, uh, the Pokes are central Arkansas half the time, amen? And I love them. But can I tell you this? A lot of the times victory kind of depends on who the opponent is. And the Bible says that Ben-Hadad, listen, he rose up in arrogance and pride against the people of God. His father had defied the people of God and apparently come out successful. So therefore, Ben-Hadad had some things going against him that ought to be noted. You see, this story is more an indictment of Ben-Hadad than it is an endorsement of Ahab. Are you all with me? So what God did here is not God saying, man, I'm behind Ahab all the way. But what he was saying is, I will not allow Ben-Hadad a victory in Israel. That's That's really what was going on. Ben-Hadad was the opponent. Ben-Hadad had defied Israel's possession. In essence, he was removing the ancient landmarks and taking territory that was not his. He was the aggressor. He was on the offense. And he was coming and bringing the fight to Israel. He besieged Samaria, not the other way around. He was denying or ignorant of Abraham's covenant. Listen, Ahab and Jezebel were wicked, that's true. But Israel was God's people. Amen? Listen, in Genesis chapter 12, God made... Listen, God had a friend named Abraham. Do you remember that? 
And God made a promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed." Do you know the fact that we're saved and we're celebrating because we have been united in Christ, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the son of David, the seed of Abraham. We're still experiencing this covenant, this this promise. Can I tell you something? Ben-Hadad, he might not have heard about this, but it's really not a good idea to curse somebody that God's blessed. Right? Right? And that's what he did. He said the gods do more. Do you know he had his pagan gods, but he was ignorant of Yahweh, Jehovah God. And so one reason Ahab was getting set up for victory is because he had the right enemy. And may I just say this? Elijah was not Ahab's real enemy. Do you know a few chapters ago when the drought was on, Y'all remember that? When Ahab finds Elijah, he goes, There you are, the one that troubles Israel. The opposite was true. But can I just say this? In this particular drama, Ben-Hadad was a wicked king who was coming against the people of God. He was defying what God had set up. And he was pagan and he was depending on numbers and political power. Do you know that he had 32 kings? Verses 12 and verse 16 refers to 32 kings. And it doesn't list who these people are, but there were smaller nations. There were were some city-states that had kings over them. And he had amassed a political group of power players to come and side with him against Ahab. That's what Ben-Hadad had done. He was depending on numbers. In 1 Samuel 14, verse 6, Jonathan told his armor bearer, It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or to save by few. Do you know that God's not impressed by political power and international alliances? Amen. Do you know God's not worried about the UN? They might ought to be worried about God, amen? Amen. But God, listen, God was not intimidated. Ben-Hadad had numbers. He was displaying pride. Isn't this odd that after making demands for wives and kids and silver and gold and then asking for Ahab's stuff, when Ahab says, no, I can't do that, he got so mad And he says, basically, I'm going to bring such a group that there won't be enough dirt in Samaria for all of us to get a handful. That's kind of what it sounded like he was saying. Right? So he's basically guaranteeing himself total, overwhelming victory. I mean, he's going to hit them hard, hit them fast, and wipe them out. That's what he says to Ahab. Now... Ben-Hadad, it's interesting that he had this group of people together. This should be noted. Do you know he was also drinking? Matter of fact, the Bible says he was drinking when he got the message. And later when they went out to fight, he was drinking himself drunk. That's not a great battle plan, by the way. Liquid courage is how the gunfighter gets killed, right? I mean, I've seen enough Westerns to know better, right? Listen, he's drinking himself drunk. He despised God. That, that, that could not be made more clear by the fact that after getting his tail whooped, he decides to go reattack because their gods are gods of the hills. Listen, he despised God. Didn't, he was ignorant of the one true God. And can I just say this? When you got that many strikes going against you, speaking for Ben-Hadad, It almost doesn't matter who the opponent is. God's going to get you. And can I just say this? I know America has military might. But can I just say this? If America shakes her fist in the face of God enough, 
it really doesn't matter who the enemy is. God can make sure he can clean somebody's clock if he needs to. And that was the case with Ben-Hadad. See, Ben-Hadad had just become arrogant. And can I just say this, that for once, Ahab actually voiced a proverb with a little bit of wisdom. He answered him and said, Tell him, let not him that girdeth on his harness boast himself as he that putteth it off. He said, hey, tell Ben-Hadad. ben said, we're going to wipe you out. He said, hey, tell Ben-Hadad, don't count your chickens before they hatched. That's, that's what he said. He said, hey, don't let him that's putting on his harness boast like someone that's already taken it off. In essence, he's mirroring a biblical truth. The Bible says that we should... Be careful, take heed when you think you stand, lest you fall. God resists the proud, but He gives yeah. grace unto the humble. Ben-Hadad was lifting himself up in pride, almost guaranteeing that he could not lose. And Ahab correctly points out that the time for boasting is not when you're putting the armor on. It's after you've done taking it off in victory. You shouldn't assume you're going to win. You know, there's a reason there's a scoreboard up in sports. Yes. Right? Right, because listen, sometimes the underdog does win. And when it comes to Ahab's success, he definitely had the right opponent. Yes, he was outnumbered. But see, Ben-Hadad was at a disadvantage because Ahab not only was Ben-Hadad the right opponent, now we see, as you continue verse 13 and 14, Ahab gets the right plan. He get, listen, he's delivered a strategy that cannot lose. It says, And behold, there came a prophet unto Ahab, king of Israel, saying, Thus saith the Lord. What do you do when you're overwhelmed? What do you, what do you really need when you're outnumbered, when you're out of options, and when you're overwhelmed? What you really need is to get a word from God. And Ahab, now, listen, he's surrounded, they've besieged him, but the prophet says to Ahab, and listen, what a mercy, what a gift that even wicked Ahab could hear from the Lord. And can I just say this? I don't believe most people's problem is ignorance of God's Word. Do you know that if you are in America and you have the ability to come to a church where the Bible's open and preach, you can get a word from God. The fact is, most people don't want to hear from God. But even wicked Ahab here gets a word from God. And the prophet tells him, Ahab, thus saith the Lord, Hast thou seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will deliver it into thy hand this day, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. And Ahab said, By whom? Can I just say this? There are times when Ahab shows signs of potential. This is a prophet of God. Ahab doesn't turn him over to Jezebel. Jezebel was a prophet killer, by the way. When the prophet says, you can win, God's going to win this, he says, by whom? And he said, thus saith the Lord, even by the young men of the princes of the provinces. Then he said, who shall order the battle? And he answered, thou. See, at this moment, Ahab listens to God's plan. He asks for specifics and he says, okay. God says he can give me the victory. He'd already drawn a line in the sand. He knew the fight was coming. And can I tell you something? I believe in, the in, in, the, in Ahab's mind, in the inevitable conclusion that he would be extremely outnumbered. Matter of fact, based on the numbers given in the text, Ben-Hadad possibly had 200,000 men. Because he, he reorganized, and in the second battle we're given this fact, that 128,000 were killed, and that wasn't all of his army. So let's just say 150,000 men against 7,000? We're talking about being outnumbered 20 to 1. 20 to 1. And do you know what Ahab does? When he knows the fight's on and he knows he's outnumbered and the prophet says God can give you victory, he goes, okay, how? Tell me how. Yeah. Do you know what I found? I found that sometimes people who are absolutely at the bottom of the rope are in the best position to just stop and listen to God and do what He says. And can I tell you something? There's power in that position. That's right. Amen. Because God says, here's how you do it. And He says, you're going to do it by these young men. Now, it, it's hard to know exactly 
what this means, but there was a group of men that Ahab knew who he was referring to. He said, by the young men of the princes of the provinces. The commentaries I've read implies that this probably would have been something like the junior ROTC. It would have been like the, the princes of each province that they would have kind of like pages sent to the capital from time to time. And they had potential for going down the roads of political power in the future, but they were really just the kids. They were the junior ROTC. They were like the Thunderbird program or whatever you want to call it. And, he's, and the prophet says, you send those young men out there. Not, listen, he didn't ask for battle-hardened generals, lieutenants, and officers. He said, no, if you want victory, you send them those young men out. 232 of the young men of the princes of the provinces, that's who you're going to send out first. At the sight of them, Ben-Hadad assumed that they were going to be easy knockovers. By the way, he just said, hey, just capture those guys. Those young men that are coming out. He had, listen, Ahab did... This is very understated in our day and age and even in the text. Ahab simply did what the prophet told him to do. That was the plan. He listened to God's plan. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, we're told that if we will trust in the Lord with all our heart, lean not into our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge Him. Do you know what Ahab's doing in verse 13 and 14? He's acknowledging God. What do I do? How do I do it? Who do I send? He had the right plan. And he, that kind of piggybacked on that point is that that meant he had the right people. He sent the exact young men that God chose. These weren't Ahab's choices. These weren't even volunteers. These were the young men that God called through this prophet to go. And so he sends them. Now, there's a verse in here that seems a little bit odd. It says in verse 15 that he numbered the young men of the princes of the province and they were 232. And after them he numbered all the people, even all the children of Israel being 7,000. Now, let me just say this. Israel did not have mandatory conscripted uh, military service They had a volunteer army. When a trumpet was blown, when a certain call was given, they weren't to draft men. Matter of fact, that appears to be what David was doing when Joab didn't want to do it and God wound up judging David. Ahab uh, Ahab apparently did the normal routine and simply asked for whoever to show up to fight and all of Israel that showed up were 7,000. Israel was larger than that as far as total population, but all of Israel that showed up to fight was 7,000. It's an interesting number, isn't it? Do you know that 7,000 is the exact number that God told Elijah had not bent the knee and had not kissed Baal? Now, I, listen, it could be coincidental, and I, I know some people are like, oh, I don't get hung up on numbers, but this stuck out to me. While it could be coincidence... That the 7,000 that showed up, and by the way, the Bible doesn't say that that was um, particularly, you know, the holy, sanctified, non bell worshiping Israel. It just said that that's who showed up, 7,000. But could I make a simple point? 7,000 did not bow the knee or kiss Baal. It is possible that the very number that were willing to defy the enemy within, Baal, will be the same number that are willing to face the enemy without. Uh, I just want to make this point. Uh, I'm not saying that this corresponds one-to-one, the same exact people. But isn't it interesting that what God told Elijah was that 7,000 had not surrendered to Baal. And that's the exact amount of men that were unwilling to surrender to Ben-Hadad. Guys, can I tell you something that scares me about America? Our fighting men at one time were supposed to take vows to, the, to uphold the Constitution and defend it from enemies. Not just abroad, not just foreign, but also domestic. But can I tell you something? For the last 60 years, the enemies of America, the domestic ones, have been filling up 
They've been infiltrating and filling up our places of education. Our, they, they have. And listen, I'm not trying to be a rebel rouser, as Dad would say, but can I just say this? That when America is supposed to be a nation under God and we become full of people who despise God, you cannot go and fight atheistic, communistic, socialist tyrants around the world and then pay the same people from an ideological standpoint to teach your children, you will not stand as a nation if you do that. And isn't it ironic that the only number of people willing to stand up and fight the invading forces of Syria were the same exact number of people who were unwilling to bow the knee to Baal? Probably coincidence, but I thought it was worth noting. Amen? And so, listen, Ahab, he had the right plan, he had the right people in place, the young men that God asked for, and then the number that was given there, 7,000, uh, and he's following God's instruction. Now listen, these young men, it should be noted, 232 young men, they go out and they begin to march towards the encamped besieging army of Syria. That's what the Bible says took place. And as they go out, a, a, a message came and been, hey dad, hey, I know you're getting just slobber knocking drunk right now, but there's 232 young men coming down this way. They come out of Samaria. What are they coming for? Well, to be honest, we can't tell. They look like young men. Well, whether they're coming for parlay and peace or whether they're coming for more, take them alive. That's what Ben Haydad said. Well, they weren't coming for parlay. They were coming to defend their country. And so his army goes out against them. And the 232, the Bible says every one, every enemy soldier that decided to surround and try to take one of them boys got their hineys by those boys. They, they killed everybody that came out to catch him. Now, he wasn't expecting that. And can I tell you something? When they fell, and may I make a point? Do you know that when God would win victories for Israel, this goes all the way back to Moses and Joshua. Do you know that when Joshua lost just a handful of men at the town of Ai, it caused him to go into soul searching and mourning? Because when you fight with God, you don't expect casualties. And that's something that most militaries and most battles, that's foreign because it's a supernatural element. You would not expect to have 100% victory and lose nobody. But these 232 men, they came out unscathed and everybody that faced them had fallen under them. And can I tell you something? I think when that happens, those enemy soldiers hadn't seen anything like that. I think they got an idea. There's more than just 232 boys out there. God's fighting for them. And they turned and they began to run. And when they began to run, listen, Ahab and the 7,000, they charged and they began to kill. And listen, God was on their side. And the Bible says the king of Israel went out. He pursued them and Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, escaped on a horse with the horsemen. Listen, they slew everyone as man, the Bible says. That means every time they had a face-to-face, -face, they won. Every time. And they slew the Syrians with a great slaughter. A horrible sight. Hundreds and thousands of men killed. But Israel was the victor. They sent the invading army home with their tail between their legs. That's what happened. Because Ahab had followed the right plan. Now here's the interesting thing. Verse 22 says, The prophet came to the king of Israel and said unto him, Go strengthen thyself and mark. See what thou doest, for at the return of the year the king of Syria will come up against thee. Do you know that prophet had no idea? I, I really believe this. He had no idea how that might shake out. But by the word of the Lord, he told Ahab, They're going to come back, Ahab. And it says... The servants of the king of Syria said unto him, Their gods are gods of the hill, therefore they were stronger than we. But let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. Do this thing, take the kings away, every man out of his place, and put captains in their rooms. By the way, this sounds like they were saying, let's get rid of the political drinking buddies that you had out there in the battlefield last time, and let's actually put some captains, some guys that have earned their stripes. Let's put some military guys there instead of your drinking buddies. 
And so they give Ben-Hadad some advice. And they said, Number thee an army like the army thou hast lost, horse for horse and chariot for chariot, and we will fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And they hearkened unto their voice. This is the battle, part two, okay? And it came to pass at the return of the year that Ben-Hadad numbered the Syrians and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. They go into Israel territory and they do the same thing. The children of Israel were numbered and were all present and went against them. And the children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids. But the Syrians filled the country. Can you just see that? It was like camp one of Israel here. Camp two of Israel, like two little flocks. And then the rest of the country was just full of enemy. Full of the enemy, that's what the Bible says. And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel, verse 28, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, and He is not God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And they pitched one over against the other seven days. And so it was that in the seventh day the battle was joined, and the children of Israel slew of the Syrians an hundred thousand footmen in one day. Those were men that had marched into Israel with the intent of killing, slaying, and spoiling Israel. And they lay dying at the hand of Israel. But the rest fled to Aphek into the city. I love this. Listen to verse 30. And there a wall fell upon 20 and 7,000 of the men that were left. Now that's not all the men, but of the men that were left, 27,000 died. This had to be a huge wall. Right? So, so they go into a city... And these are 27,000 men that ran away from the battle. So 100,000 got killed. These guys considered um, discretion to be the better part of valor. And so they just discretionarily exited the battle scene. And they go and they're hiding behind a wall. Now I have seen pictures of the Middle East of Israel and like the huge wailing wall. And there's places where large structures have been built by humans over the past and, and apparently there was a massive, massive wall because it fell on 27,000 of them. Can I just say this? When you're on the wrong side, there's really no safe place to be. You want to make sure you're right with God because Aphek was in Israel. It was up there in Asher. It was just, I think, to the, um, to the west of the Sea of Galilee. And this, this wall fell on them. It was not where they were supposed to be, by the way. They should have went on home. But they went and hid in Aphek. Boom. Wall falls and gets them. That's when you know you're on the wrong side of the battle. Amen. Like just nothing's going to work. And listen, it says that when that happened, they, they got victory. And it says the rest fled. And it says that Ben-Hadad fled and came into the city into an inner chamber. Now, I talked about the reason that Ahab won was because he had the right plan. He was following God's leadership. He had the right people It doesn't say in that second battle, but based on that first battle, those 232 young men and then the 7,000, do you know that they didn't have the experience nor the accolades of others? They were not captains, they were young men. Yet it should be noted that God calls, listen, God calls the weak. He calls those that He chooses. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Bible says this, that it's, that it's not many mighty. Matter of fact, I'll just read 1 Corinthians 1 verse 23. Paul says, But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Really, that's a picture of what God did with Ahab. Ahab was a wicked king. 
the 232 princes, they were weak young men, yet God chose them to bring to naught things that were mighty, that no flesh should glory in His presence. And then verse 30 of 1 Corinthians 1, Paul says, But of Him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Last point tonight. Do you know why Ahab found victory? Because those two battles had the right purpose. Do you know why the man of God said that Ahab would win? He said it twice. At the first battle in chapter uh, 20, verse 13 and 14 of our text, he says, listen, Ahab, he says that in verse 13, Behold, I will deliver this multitude into thine hand this day, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. And when he returns and he speaks to the king again, he says there in verse 28, There came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude in thine hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Do you know really this whole story? It's really not about the battle. It's, not, it's really not about... Uh, tactics, and that's why we don't have a ton of those. I mean, I would love to have seen exactly how 7,000 people ran 180,000 people off. I mean, I would have loved to have seen more details, like exactly what did they use? You know, did they have bows and arrows? You know, did they have the new Gatlin machine gun rock chunker? I mean, I don't know what they had back then. But, uh, but whatever they had, I would have liked to have known some of those details, but we don't get those details. We don't know all the specifics, but we do know this in the big picture, the purpose of that battle. The reason God, why would God help Ahab? He said, first of all, Ahab, so that you will know. See, Ahab had already seen the showdown on Mount Carmel. He had already seen that Elijah was the prophet of the real God. But then he goes home to Jezebel and he also knows that Jezebel seems to have a little power over Elijah. I think Ahab was in a conflict many times. He did know, listen, it's clear that God extended mercy and grace to Ahab. As a matter of fact, after the next ordeal in the next chapter with Naboth, do you know that when judgment is pronounced, you can read this, the Bible says that Ahab even made or had repentance towards God somewhat. Ahab is a man who's ruling God's people, yet he is in an idolatrous place. And yet God shows mercy and grace to him. And the purpose of the victory was so that you would know. Do you know the real big deal in God's mind was his own revelation of himself and his own glory? It was for God's glory. That's what God was about. God is more than happy to use those younger men. He's more than happy to take 7,000 and empower them against 150,000 or whatever the number would have been. Because the purpose was this. This particular battle has Ahab fighting on the right side. He had the right who to fight? Proud, arrogant, pagan enemies of God. And so let me bring this down with some application. We are in a battle. Could I remind you who it is that we're fighting? We're not fighting Ben Hadad, but we do have an enemy. And by the way, it's not your spouse. Your enemy's not your spouse. Your enemy's not your pagan neighbor. Your enemy is not people that sell alcohol and drugs to our neighbors. And there's problems in our community, but you know the real enemy is invisible. It's the real enemy is spiritual. See, Ahab, he was fighting the right enemy. Who do we fight? We fight against Satan and his legions. When do we fight? Can I just point this out? We don't get to pick when we fight. Do you know that Ahab did not sign up for a battle on this particular uh, account here? Ben-Hadad just showed up and brought the battle to him. Did you all notice that? Can I just say this in, many, in much the same way? The reason 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9, if you don't have that marked in your Bible, you really ought to. 
It says, be sober, be vigilant. Isn't that odd? Ben-Hadad was not sober. But in this particular account, it appears that Ahab was. Ahab was paying attention when God spoke. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. You're supposed to resist whenever the devil shows up, but the devil is walking about, seeking whom he may devour. And can I tell you something? Just because you're not one that he is able to devour today, you lay your armor down, you quit being sober, you quit being vigilant. Listen, today's conqueror and victor Victor can be tomorrow's victim if you lay your armor down. Because the battle doesn't end. Listen, don't be mistaken. Just because you have a, a, an area of success, just because you may win one battle, the war rages on and there's another battle tomorrow. And the devil is very patient. And the Bible says that is why you are to be sober and be vigilant every day because you don't know when the battle's coming. Where will the battle be? It really doesn't matter. How will you fight? You better do like Ahab did. I hate to say that. Man, he made some bad mistakes. Like who he married. Right? But do you know in this moment, he did what God asked him to do. When the man of God said, Ahab, you do it this way and do it that way, he obeyed. Are you willing to follow God's instruction? Can I just say this? If you'll follow God's plan, you'll experience God's power. That's right. Amen. You depart from God's plan, you lose God's power. That's generally how it works. But the most important question when it comes to our battle is not who or when or where or how we fight. Really, the most important question based on our text is this. Why? Why do we do what we do? Why did God bring victory to Ahab? Because can I just say this? I want victory. I don't want to be like Ahab. But I do want God to fight my battles for me. Because can I tell you something? The battles that I have, the battle to be the kind of husband that Lauren needs, the battle to be the kind of dad that my kids need, the battle to be the kind of man of God that God's called me to be, those are battles. Listen, sooner or later the devil will lay siege to those areas in your life that can be the most fruitful. Those are God-given areas. Sir, if you're a husband, that is a God-given calling. The, you may say, well, you don't know how we got together. It doesn't matter. It does not matter. But, and see, I know people, they, they, don't, they don't like this about my dad, but my dad's simply going to open the book and he's going to say, Mike, if she's your wife, then you're supposed to love her. That's right? right? That's right. She tricked me into marrying her. Well, okay, but you did. <laughs> right? What does God say to do to a wife? Isn't it funny when he just says, Husbands, love your wives unless they are really ornery. He didn't say that. Right? He didn't say that. But you know what a lot of us say? Well, I, I, you know what? I'll review God's plan, but I'm not committing to it. Okay, well, you're not going to have God's power. So, but, but here's the thing. These are battles in our lives. Do you know that your role as a mom or a dad in your home will be under attack? And I'm not talking by your teenagers. I'm talking by the enemy. And by the way, your teenager's not the enemy. And teenager, your mom and dad are not the enemy. They're not. Amen. No, the real enemy is trying to derail you. And, but listen carefully. But why do we fight? Do you know why I want to be the right husband? Why are these battles worth engaging in? Because we should fight to make God known and to bring Him glory. That's it. Right. Amen. That should be your motivation. Well, I want to be a good husband so my wife will be a good wife and I'll have a happier home. There is no doubt about it. When you've got two people submitted to the Lord, submitting mutually to one another and loving God and following His Word, it's a happy home. That's what God intended for it to be. But that's not the purpose. It's not some kind of pragmatic, I'll go along, get along, so things will get better, so I have less to worry about. Listen, the purpose of a, of a good marriage... 
Paul says it in Ephesians 5. This is a mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. When a Christian home is typifying a husband loving his wife like Christ loved the church and the wife submitting to her husband as unto the Lord, it is a picture of Christ. You are making Christ known in your home. If that's your motivation, God will fight some battles for you. He will. Listen, can I say this? If God will fight for Ahab, He'll fight for you. Amen? Amen. Yeah. God's no respecter of persons. Did Ben-Hadad enter into Israel's God-given territory? Yes, he did. And guess what? The devil's coming to your house tomorrow. Amen. Or the next day or whenever. But the siege is going to come sooner or later. And let me tell you something. If Ahab had enough sense to say to the man of God, all right, what do I do? How do I do it? That's what I'll do then. Man, that's his position of humility. I think Ahab had a proud streak in him. But do you know, in light of overwhelming odds, he humbled himself and simply did what God said. In chapter 20, and we're not at the end. He, listen, Ahab, I'm sorry, he couldn't even finish a chapter right. Okay? <laughs> He's really going the right way right now. He got two victories. Parents, do you know why? Do you know the Bible says, that the, the last book, Malachi, God says that He would turn the hearts. One of the pre-Messianic, the forerunner of Christ, one of His goals, John the Baptist, was to turn the hearts of the children to the fathers and turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. For God's glory, by the way. Do you know that God desires a godly seed? Do you know why, parents, we should love and raise our kids for the Lord? Because it's cheaper than letting them go to jail. No. I mean, listen, can, can I just say this? Some, sometimes, if we're not careful, we just get pragmatic and say, well, yeah, I want God's blessing because it's better than the alternative. No. We should, listen, we should have the mindset that I'm raising my kids for God's glory. And you young people, listen, do you know that when you're willing to go against the trend and not act like the world and not dress like the world and not talk like the world, when you're willing to go against the trend and stand and bring glory to God, you, listen, the devil hates that. And you may say, okay, fine. I'll stay plugged in. Why? So Brother Clay doesn't bother me. That's the wrong motive. What if you said, you know what, I'm going to stay plugged in. I'm going to stay in the Word of God. I'm going to do right for God's glory. Because I've told people I'm saved. You know what, Brother Steve Marilla, our Kenyan missionary, he may only get to come through about once every four or five years. I don't want him coming back and saying, hey, where's Braden at? In four years. I mean it. I don't want him coming back and saying, hey, whatever happened to Brooklyn? Whatever happened to... I don't want him asking, hey, what happened to so-and-so? And me say, well, they lost. They're a spiritual casualty. You be sober, you be vigilant, because your enemy, he is going to lay attack on you. Why should you stand for Christ? Can I tell you why? Because it brings God glory. And isn't it nice when someone says, well, how's so-and-so doing? Man, they're serving the Lord. They're doing good. We're not perfect. But can I also say something? You're not Ahab. If God was willing to fight for him, why don't you submit to God? Do you know if you'll submit to God and resist the devil, he'll flee from you. You don't have to be scared of the devil. Man, he's been at it a long time. Yes. He's got legions with him. Yes. But you've got a good shepherd. And I don't care if we look like a little flock surrounded by darkness. If we'll do what God says, guess what God will do? He'll fight your battle for you. He'll bring such a great victory. I believe that. And listen, if I didn't believe that, listen, I'd be scared to death. I got five kids. I mean it. Listen, I'd, I'd take Brother DJ and his family. We'd get off the grid. I say DJ because I wouldn't survive off the grid without DJ. I mean, we just go to Northwest Territories, find about a million acres of nothing and get away from everything. But can I tell you something? That's not the answer. I don't have to be scared of this present dark age. I just need to listen to God and walk in the light. And He'll win your battle for you. So I'm going to ask Megan to come to the piano.
Can I just say this? What is your goal? Listen, you may say, well, Brother Clay, I know there's a battle and I do want success. But is your motive for God's glory or is it for some other earthly reason? What is your motive? See, I believe God gets very excited about making His name known when you're willing to make that your priority. If you'll seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, I believe this is a powerful principle. If you'll seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, He'll take care of everything else you need. He'll take care of everything else you need. So I want to challenge you tonight. This message has been aimed at those of us that saved. Because can I say this? If you're here tonight and you're not saved, you're not in a battle with the devil. You're on the same side he is. He's already got you. If you're not saved, Jesus Christ loves you. He knows exactly who you are and what you've been through. You're not here by accident. If you're here tonight and you've never put your faith and trust in Christ Jesus as Lord, could I just say this? He loves you. He died on the cross for our sins according to the Scripture. He was buried and He rose again. You can call on Jesus' name and He'll save you. And you have to be saved first. You're not a soldier first. You have to be saved first. Amen? So I'd like you to stand with me and Christians will be praying. I'm sorry I've preached a long time tonight. There's a battle coming. Christian, can I tell you something? If you've not been reminded lately, maybe this message tonight is for you to be reminded. Dad, Mom, you may think, i got a pretty good thing going right now. Well, then be sober, be vigilant, because you still have an enemy. Are you in such a place in your life that you can hear God if He did speak to you? Some of you need to just commit and say, God, I've heard from you tonight. And I know, listen, without you, I cannot win. So Jesus, I want to trust you. I want to follow you. You may be here tonight and say, Brother Clay, I need to be saved. Then would you step out and come? I'll meet you right here. If God's dealt with your heart, I can direct you to somebody who can spend some time and share with you how you can know that you're saved. Because there's nothing more important. And then if you're saved, don't be an Ahab. Ahab's life was not a good one. But can I tell you this? At least during this chapter, he had enough sense at first to listen to God. Have you listened to God? Are you living for His glory? Some of us need to stop and examine, what do I do every day? What do I do every week? And why do I do it? Am I living for God's glory? Or if I just become pragmatic, getting by from day to day for earthly reasons? She's going to play one more verse. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. As you're standing there, can you say that to God?